Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. In a week's time, Israel will mark former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's first year out of power. His rivals have managed to hold together a unique right-center-left coalition, united on almost no issue at all, save the determination, of course, to block Netanyahu's return to the office he occupied for the preceding dozen years. The government, headed by Naftali Bennett and his alternate Yair Lapid, has managed to survive several policy and personal crises in a row, but is under constant pressure, both external and internal. Will it live to celebrate two years in power with Lapid shortly thereafter taking over from Bennett? Joining us to deliberate this question, from Central Israel, former Knesset member Dov Lipman, who is the founder and CEO of Yad Laolim. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you. Also joining us from elsewhere in Central Israel is Mr. Mitchell Barak, who is the CEO of Kivun Research Group. Thank you for joining us as well, sir. Thank you. And with me here in the studio is our TV7 editor-at-large, host of Watchman Talk and uh, Powers in Play, and so much more, Mr. Amir Olgan. Amir, give us uh, a tip of the iceberg, if you will, of, of what is the current political state of play. Well, you know, both of our guests, uh, Dov and Mitchell, have been there. Dov as a member of Knesset and Mitchell as an advisor and more. Um, when the Knesset is in session, you have Monday and Wednesday as the crucial dates. And uh, uh, on a Monday, you have uh, certain bills. And uh, on a Wednesday, uh, you may have uh, other votes or vice versa. And... Uh, in the current state of affairs, each Monday, we hear that uh, the government is going to collapse later this week, either this Monday, um, either a vote of no confidence, or there will be a vote of con no confidence uh, in which you need an alternative government, uh, presumably headed by Netanyahu, or else uh, there will be a call for early elections. And when Wednesday comes and goes, have no fear, come Friday night, there will be a poll on television predicting that had the elections been held today, the government wouldn't have survived, and then you get to next Monday. So by the end of July, um, which is uh, less than eight weeks from now, if the government survives, it will see the high holidays come and go and go into the winter session and drag along. Uh, it wouldn't gallop. It would... Uh, Until roughly March? Well, <laughs> that's, that's uh, so far away in the future. Um, it is beyond the horizon. It's uh, beyond the moon. It's uh, closer to Mars. So uh, right now, the government doesn't have any achievement uh, to show for, for its uh, uh, survival. But it's creeping along, it's crawling, um, it's surviving. And uh, lo and behold, as you said, a year has passed. Netanyahu did not manage to uh, go back to power. And later on, uh, if I have a minute, I'll say something about synchronizing his political and judicial watches. Indeed. Well, uh Mr. Lippmann, when you were in parliament uh, as a member of Knesset uh, from the alternates party, uh, Yesh Atid, uh, you saw from, from behind the scenes the, the process of this party, which uh, uh, someone once characterized uh, to me, and, and I must agree with him, it's very much uh, similar to a television production. Everything is very sharp, everything is on time, everything is... Uh, very thoroughly calculated, and yet, even though uh, Yair Lapid is credited with uh, the formation of this government and holding it together, uh, he doesn't really seem to uh, ultimately avert so many crises that uh, it seems like any moment now this government may collapse. So what's interesting is that whenever these uh, crises uh, uh, arise, the one who usually jumps in to sit with whoever the complaining party is, it's often Yair Lapid who sits down and tries to work out those issues. However, even the greatest magician and greatest presenter 
can't keep a government together if every single week you're having these issues. I can tell you from my time in Knesset, we had over the course of the two years that we were in government, there were here and there, there were weeks where a coalition crisis came up and it had to be dealt with. But the moment they started becoming a regular item, where every single week it was about survival, that's when it becomes impossible. Because that's also when every other party starts smelling elections, and now they have to start positioning themselves for elections and start speaking back to their base, which may not have been so happy with this very broad coalition. So as much as Yair Lapid and Yeshatid tries to be the glue to hold this coalition together, there's a certain point where those fault lines are so great and, and where the, the number of urgent issues that come up are, 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 are weekly and not daily, and it can't hold itself together at that point. Indeed. Uh, Mr. Barak, I'd, I'd like to hear from you as a former advisor of uh, the uh, current head of the opposition, Mr. Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, you mentioned in previous productions that we held here uh, how he always had the patience to wait things out. And, and uh things uh, seem to always work in his advantage, ultimately, when you allow it to uh, patiently uh, run its course. Do you see this currently in, in the same format of that situation, just to strategically wait to see how things emerge and ultimately uh, this government will pass, it will not survive, nobody expects it to survive uh, beyond a year or two, but uh, as far as we're concerned at this stage, uh, this government has managed to go far beyond all expectations. Well, I think uh, former Prime Minister Netanyahu, he likes chaos and he likes crisis. And he liked it when he was prime minister and he thrived on it. And he likes to see it on the other side as well. And I think that's part of his strategy is to wait it out, let them make mistakes, try and push them for mistakes, not cooperate in any way, meaning there's not even one issue as we found out from both things he said and from what his, you know, uh, spokesperson, his quite vocal spokesperson, Miri Regevis said, they're not willing to cooperate with this government on any issue because they believe it's rotten to the core, it's evil, and it has to be replaced. So he's patient. He believes he was the best prime minister of the state of Israel and will be prime minister again. And I have to say, we've spoken about prime minister, uh, about Benjamin Netanyahu a lot. Now we're speaking about him as head of the opposition. He's basically run unopposed for the last 12 years. And what do I mean by that? There is no one that has come as a candidate against Benjamin Netanyahu. And I go all the way back to the election of, uh, of uh, when Herzog was head of the Labor Party. He wasn't even running for prime minister. He was running for prime minister together with Livni. And, and they were going to have a rotation. And so far, people were running on rotations or they were running together as two-headed parties or as two parties with rotating heads in this. And at the end of the day, I mean, the people want some kind of solid leadership, some kind of even dictatorship. I mean, if you look at the Knesset today, most of the parties in Knesset are not democratically elected through a membership, but it's one person in charge who appoints all the Knesset members. Now, the Likud is elected, but it's basically the people that many of the people that Netanyahu want. But all the other parties, whether it's Blue and White Yer Lapid, whether it's, excuse me, Yeshatid of Yer Lapid, Blue and White of Gantz, Lieberman's party, Saar's party, uh, the religious parties, uh, Naftali Bennett's party, Shas, Aguda, there's all one person or, a, or a, a two people that are picking the entire list. So he's operating in that vacuum where maybe people are saying it's time for leadership. And yet the most democratic party in the uh, Knesset at this stage seems to be then uh, Labour or uh, possibly the Likud. Because uh, when you look at also the, the recent polls, Meretz is out in the next election. Uh, these were the past two polls uh, public uh, published, excuse me. We don't seem to have any horizon uh, for a future election in which one decisive candidate will win because even though the mandates are fluctuating a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left, 
we're in the same saga all over again. Well, that's true. But um, uh, four years ago, or rather uh, three, uh, in the beginning of uh, 2019, Gantz emerged. And uh, who knows, maybe there will be uh, another Gantz. Now, Netanyahu is both um, a politician on trial and a defendant in the Knesset. And he uh, is trying to synchronize these two watches, the political and the legal one. How does he do that? Um, he is aiming at getting a plea bargain, uh, which will uh, keep him out of jail and will also allow him to run again. Um, now, the Israeli law um, makes a distinction between a prime minister and a regular minister. A regular minister cannot serve uh, when uh, he's uh, being indicted and uh, obviously when he's on trial, the way Netanyahu is. A prime minister, at least up to now, the high court allowed it. There is a middle ground, the alternate prime minister. This has never been put to the test to the high court. So a scenario in which Gidon Saar, one of uh, uh, his former allies and, and who does not necessarily have a very bad relationship with him, could come and say, okay, I will join you now for the remainder of the period. Not Stay I will join you. you, you join me. Right, as prime minister for one year, have your trail uh, exhausted, and once you return, you will receive the, the premiership but, for the remainder? But what is the uh, position that Netanyahu takes um, in such a government? He cannot be a minister. He may be able to be an alternate prime minister, and he may be a Knesset speaker, because the political power that he will have will, will not uh, have anything to do with his title. He will still, as Mitchell and Dov said, uh, he will still be powerful as the head of the right religious bloc. So yes, this is a possibility, but if Tsar does that, um, he will be depicted as uh, having uh, reneged on his uh, promises and may not have a future in the next election. So all of the politicians, all of the major politicians have to weigh their immediate gains with the uh, short-term or mid-term uh, projections. What is the current state of play, uh, uh Mr. Lippmann, uh, of the opposition within the current political constellation. We saw some fractures between the national right to the religious uh, parties. Is this now exacerbating or is everything under check? Well, I find myself uh, in the Knesset a few times a week, and I was there uh, this, you know, during these last few days as well. Uh, the opposition has made a decision that they are going to object to any bill that comes from the coalition. That is going to be their stance, even a bill which is in line with the opposition's ideology, because they want this government to fall. And in line with what we were just talking about a moment ago, yeah, you have to think about it this way. Merits. A merits voter who believes in we should be working towards peace, Israel should be giving up land for peace, and they're in a coalition where they saw a Jerusalem Day parade, which they see as an affront to their entire ideology. On the right side, you have Gidon Saar's party. Gidon Saar identifies as a right winger, even more right wing perhaps than many in Likud and many in his party. And they see huge amounts of money going to Arab populations who are against the state of Israel. They're all struggling. And that is why Gidon Saar has now made an ultimatum. There's a law. And in next week, we will see a major, major possibility of this coalition falling apart over a law related to Judea and Samaria. I won't get into the details. It's a law that's passed every five years without a problem, and the Arab party in the coalition is saying we won't support it. And Gidon Saar has said that will lead to the end of this government. Why am I bringing this up? I can tell you, Gidon Saar is 100% in negotiations as we speak with Netanyahu and Likud about how to make a new government within the framework of this Knesset and not to go to new elections. And one of the reasons he can do that, you mentioned the trial, is because the prosecution is imploding in this trial. Their, their major claims against Netanyahu are, are just dissipating in front of our eyes. And that could give Gidon Saar an ability to come off the tree and say, yes, I was against 
Netanyahu when he had these terrible, terrible claims against him. But now that it seems to be dwindling to almost nothing, maybe we can work together with him in some constellation or another. So all these moving parts are taking place, and therefore the opposition is strong, and they're saying we will support nothing, let this government fall apart. Dov, you are exaggerating. There are three cases, only one uh, up to now uh, has been presented. And in that case, there are several charges, bribery as well as uh, uh, fraud and breach uh, of trust. So even if the bribery charge, which is indeed the most severe one, uh, is in doubt, the other uh, one there and the other two in the additional cases uh, are not. So Netanyahu may uh, have uh, a floor of uh, breach of trust and fraud, even uh, if he is away from the ceiling. With that being said, of course, uh, Mr. Lebman was speaking about the fact that major points against Netanyahu's trial from exactly. uh, the prosecutor's perspective are slowly falling apart. Uh, not uh, to but, really. of course, this there is... are still a lot of things that are holding up in court and, and plenty of deliberations ahead of time. Um, but I, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Balak, when we're talking about uh, the current uh, challenges of, of the coalition, it seems that the crises that we're ex experiencing, seeing in front of us uh, evolve uh, and dissipate one after the other, they are taking a toll from the electorate in the polls that were projected in the recent uh, days and recent weeks for that matter. And uh, the Meretz party, for instance, which is uh, small but yet a significant partner with it, uh, within this coalition with uh, the health minister, of course, holding uh, uh, or the portfolio of health minister within this party. Uh, it seems like they are not going to be around for much longer because of this challenge at hand. Well, I am personally glad that my colleagues in the public opinion and research business can make a living but I am shocked at the unprofessionalism of many of the polls that are published and the media for repeating them. So first of all, let me say, we, it's nice to say if elections were held today, who would you vote for? Well, we don't even know who the parties are and who's running. Is Gantz really gonna run again? Is Saar gonna run by himself? Is he gonna get together with Yamina? Where is Orly Levy Abuxist gonna be? Is she gonna be with the Likud, with Merits, with Levy? We don't know anything. There are gonna be seismic changes. We don't know what it looks like. That's the first thing. First thing. The second thing is, as we heard in the last election, Merits is not going over the threshold. It was a lead in Haaretz, in Jerusalem, everywhere. It's the most ridiculous thing and it's unprofessional and I'll tell you why. Besides that they do a poll of 500 or 600 people on an internet panel, which is not as good as a phone poll, but let's say it is. The threshold to get into the Knesset is three and a half percent. The margin of error on these surveys is four and a half percent. So you're reporting as a headline that they're not gonna get over and get into the Knesset when, when the, the threshold to get into the Knesset is lower than the margin of error. So when they do a, a poll of 500 or 600 people, 17 people vote for merits versus 25. So if it was 25 in their poll, merits would get four seats. And because it's only 17, merits is gonna be decimated and the voters have spoken. It's ridiculous. Come on, I mean, Israelis are intelligent people and newspapers and media organizations should be responsible. This is not, should be what they're looking for. But I'm still glad that all the pollsters are making a living, but not this way. And it's too early in the election to tell, and it doesn't matter. What we can tell from these surveys is that the brand of Netanyahu is very strong, the Likud is very strong, and they will be the dominant force in the next election. That's what it looks like now. Uh, 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 Amir is correct. There could be a new leader that emerges like Gantz or someone else. But for right now, as I said earlier in the program, Netanyahu has basically ran unopposed as the leader, as the most fit leader for the state of Israel for the last 12 years. I don't see anyone being able to come out now and really challenge him. And if you're going to tell me that a group of people are going to challenge or consortium or a rotation of people, the Israeli voter looks at that, especially voters to the right, and they want leadership. They want someone that can travel around the world, someone that can represent Israel, and someone that makes decisions, even if they, they're like a dictator in their own party or in the country. 
I, I wonder when Mitchell uh, uh, says that the Israeli uh, people, the Israeli electorate is intelligent, what his margin of error is. Uh, perhaps he, <laughs> he has seen other Israelis than uh, I've encountered. But, um, but it's true. Uh, many Israelis would like to see leadership or leadership qualities regardless of where they are going to be led. Uh, the issues themselves are hardly uh, spoken of. And um, uh, because Netanyahu uh, has told uh, the opposition bloc to oppose whatever the coalition is bringing forward, if tomorrow Bennett uh, were to table a resolution saying that Israel is now a religious halachic country and uh, Netanyahu is going to be both king and chief rabbi, Netanyahu would have voted against it just to spite Bennett. Uh, not just to spite Bennett, but to make sure that this government goes nowhere and, and crumbles uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, but, uh, you know, all joking aside, when we're looking at the near future, and we have about six and a half minutes uh, uh, left for today's program, uh, I'd like to ask you, Mr. Lipman, what will the next elections be about? Will it be about leadership at a time of global discourse where uh, there is a lack of leadership, not only uh, here in Israel, but in the United States, in Europe, and, and elsewhere? Or are we going to uh, have more focus on domestic issues, something that has not really yielded a lot of results for any candidate in the last decade. I'm really sad to have to answer the question because the next election will be yes Netanyahu or no Netanyahu, exactly as it's been for all the last four election cycles. And I'm sad that that's the case because I do believe there are very real issues on the table. I run an organization called Yad La Olim. We're working for new immigrants. We have so many issues on our legislative agenda, which we want to help for Olim as a non-political uh, entity. And just the fact that it's not even part of the discourse when we come to elections is really sad. But it 100 percent will be that. Uh, because remember, we now had a government which combined together right wing and left wing, and they tried to make a find a way to work together. So it's now the one thing which will come up for sure, though, that the Netanyahu camp will say it's not just about Netanyahu, but they will say you must go with us to have a strong right wing government. You can't trust anyone who was part of this government. And those in the left camp will also say, if you're in the left, we weren't able to get anything done in this past government. You must go with us. But they won't get down to the nitty gritty of issues. It'll all come out again about Netanyahu. That is the hotbed issue. And Israel is split. Yes, Netanyahu and no Netanyahu. And therefore, that's why. And again, I totally understand Mitchell's point that we have no idea what the actual outcome will be based on polls today. But there, it does seem to be that we're within a range of getting back to nobody being able to form a government again because the country is so evenly divided on that Netanyahu question. Which in such a scenario, Yair Lapid would be a prime minister for quite a long time, Mr. Barak? Uh, I mean, he would be a prime minister depending on who brings down the government. Right. Uh, but, but, you know, so that that's still unclear. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'll agree with Dov that it's going to be, um, you know, yes, Netanyahu, no Netanyahu. But again, he's he successfully set the parameters of making the election about him. And the fact that he's voting against, you know, everything this government does. I remember I, I when I was he was head of the opposition the first time around in about 1993 and he voted against Jerusalem when Robin was prime minister in order to bring down the government, meaning he's been doing this for a while. He believes that if, if you don't think that the government has a right to rule and to govern and you're trying to replace it, then there's no reason that you should work with them. You should work every, and that's Netanyahu's message. He's very, very clear. So that when he gets to the campaign, he's already set up the campaign. We will not work with these people. They're bad for Israel. And even if they try and do a little good, in the end of the day, they're doing horrible damage. They're miserable people, they're evil people, and the future of the state of Israel is at risk. However, when we're talking about uh, the current government, it's a government without teeth. And Netanyahu does come with a clear agenda, a clear portfolio of what are my uh, plans for the state of Israel? How do I see this plan uh, taking place? Uh, is this something that will ultimately convince the the 
people who are yet to be decided or undecided with regard to what direction to go? Well, Netanyahu wants to run away from his record and on the government's non-record. And then, of course, they come back at him and say, you had 12 years uh, to uh, push uh, through whatever platform you had. Why didn't you do it at the time? I can tell you in total certainty and confidence, um, because I know what the next elections will be about. It's WK. Who knows? It's too early. Uh, we don't know what will happen until uh, the elections. Even when the government falls, it takes three, four, five months and things uh, can happen in the middle. And sometimes it's really ironic. You know, Netanyahu earlier or, or a few days ago uh, said, aha, uh -huh, Hamas did not fire rockets at Jerusalem because it is for a weak Bennett government. And um, the answer is, this is deterrence. Didn't you want Hamas uh, to uh, have this quiet for quiet policy? So it's, it's the same reality, no matter how you try to picture it. And obviously, Bennett, who is not going to, to survive, he's going to uh, lose the prime minister anyway. He's not going to be Israel's next prime minister. He may reconsider his own position and, who knows, perhaps retire for a while. In one sentence, uh, projections, so we can later come and look at it and, and see whether you were right or wrong. Mr. Lippman, when is the next election? I, I do believe it'll be sometime in the fall to winter. I, I don't see how this can last for uh, much longer than that. Mr. Barak? I have no idea. We're, you know, this government has lasted longer than a lot of people thought. It was established. They passed the budget. You know, so they're still going. Who knows how long they can go for? They might Indeed. be able to hold on and they might not. Uh, I would not want to be on record saying whether they're going to, you know, rise or fall. But so far, uh, you know, you know, I would call Bennett a caretaker prime minister. He is taking care of business as a prime minister. He's not the most charismatic person. He's not the greatest leader in the eyes of Israelis, but he's managing a cabinet. He's managing the government and he's managing the country Indeed. along with oh. Yair Lapid who's more like the chairman waiting to take over as the CEO. Because our time is up, uh, I'm saved from uh, having a prediction. Indeed. Well, this is all the time that we have indeed. And uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Lippman, Mr. Barak, and Mr. Olin for being part of today's panel. I'd like to thank our viewers as well. We will see you next time.